Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. We're always excited around here when February comes along because every February for the last three or four years, we've kicked all the men out for the month and we host amazing women in science, adventure, exploration, and conservation from all over the world. So this month has been a ton of fun so far. I'd say we've got about 30 events under our, our belt so far with another 20 or so still to go before February uh, comes to an end. So we're going to continue today uh, with another fun event. So today we are hanging out with Gabby Salazar. She's a photographer and conservationist. She travels around the globe to document rare and endangered species and to raise awareness about environmental issues. She's a National Geographic Explorer, a former president of the North American Nature Photography Association, a U.S. Fulbright Scholar in Photography, and an Associate Fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. So Gabby, at age 19, she founded a student magazine with Nature's Best Photography to promote photography as a way to connect kids to nature. And she continues to do things like that, teaching photography to children and teenagers around the world. So Gabby, it's so awesome to have you hanging out with us today. We have a great group of classrooms and we're looking forward to getting to know you a little better today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. And hi to everyone in your classrooms. Um, I'm just going to share a little presentation about my work as a conservation photographer, and then we'll have some time for questions. So I think I'll just go ahead and share my screen so we can actually look at some photos of some really awesome animals. That sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Okay. All right. Can everybody see a bear? We see a bear and it is full screen. Awesome. Okay, so um, so what is conservation photography? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work in this field, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I got started as well. So this is a this is a bear, an Alaskan brown bear, by the way, on a, um, a photography shoot that I did up in Alaska a few years ago. But a long, long time ago, uh, when I was just 11 years old, I actually got my first camera. This was a time when I had to shoot with film rather than digital cameras. Um, and my dad took me out to a friend's backyard bird garden and I photographed uh, some birds like these bluebirds you see. And I was really interested in watching the animals through the lens, but also in sharing my photographs with other people when I came back home. And I was pretty amazed, I think, because people would say, wow, I didn't know that these animals were right in my backyard. And I really kind of understood the power of photography to kind of open people's eyes and to get them excited about nature. And so that's really how I got started. And from the time I was 11, I just could not stop taking photos and was really interested in um, photographing animals in particular. And now the thing was at that point, I couldn't afford to travel around the world and my family um, didn't take foreign you know, vacations in foreign countries or um, vacations to go photograph animals. So I had to make a lot of photos in my backyard in North Carolina where I grew up. So this image to the, um, of the, the bee is actually taken about a mile from my home. And that ended up winning an international photo competition when I was around 14 years old. So I think that's just an important point to start with is that you don't have to go far away to take incredible pictures that can win you awards and that can get people excited about nature. But since then, I have had an amazing opportunity through National Geographic to go to places around the world to take photos. Uh, just a few months ago, I was in Panama and I got to photograph some sloths. And that was one of my favorite nature experiences recently. So you can see the little baby sloth that's tucked into its mother's arms. And that was a really amazing moment to watch when the mother uncurled and the little baby just peeked out. And then on that particular evening, I spent almost gosh, eight hours that day, just sitting and watching the sloth and sloths don't do a lot in even in eight hours. <laughs> they don't move very much, but there were a few moments where the baby actually went out on its own. And that's part of what I do as a photographer is just sit, I'm patient and I wait for those special moments uh, to be able to create photos. Now, today I live in Florida. So I grew up in North Carolina but I live in Florida now because I'm a, actually a PhD student. So I'm studying um, to get my doctorate and I study at the School of Forest Resources and Conservation at the University of Florida. So a lot of my days are like 
spent like you guys right now in a classroom reading, but on the weekends, I get to go out and photograph animals. And I still get to take photos um, and create photo stories. And this is from a recent um, moment in one of the freshwater springs here, about 45 minutes from my house. This is a manatee and you can see the baby manatee um, and it's actually nursing. Um, so it's nursing and it's able to um, nurse underwater, of course. It's pretty incredible to be able to, to capture that moment and see that really natural behavior as a, as a person just kind of floating next to this manatee underwater. And this is taken using an underwater camera, which I'm now starting to get into here in Florida. But part of my work as a conservation photographer is not just photographing kind of these amazing animals and you know, amazing scenes. It's also photographing some of the problems that our world faces because there are a lot of challenges. You know, there's deforestation in certain parts of the world. Um, and there's also issues like the wildlife trade. So, you know, here's an image of baby monkeys in a wildlife market in Southeast Asia. And this is a big challenge that wildlife faces around the world is that people want to keep wildlife as pets and animals are taken from the wild and put into cages and often not in very um, safe or humane conditions. And so part of my job is to not just photograph those magical moments, but to document the problems as well. And I think that's the difference between being just a nature photographer and a conservation photographer is the conservation photographers really tell both sides of the story and they use images to get people interested in these issues and hopefully to get them to do something about the issues. But today I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about one of my favorite conservation stories that I've gotten to work on, which was on the island of Mauritius. And that's because this is a story um, that really is a bright spot in conservation. So sometimes I get to document the problems and sometimes I get to document the really hopeful stories. And that is my favorite type of work to do. So Mauritius is an island um, in the Indian Ocean. It is off kind of the east coast of Madagascar, the east coast of the continent of Africa. And it's really tiny. You can see how little it is compared to even Madagascar there. But I went to Mauritius and spent about six months there working on a photography story um, that was really about how people are saving animals from extinction. So Mauritius is a pretty amazing place. It doesn't have many mammals. Um, some of the only mammals are bats. So all of those little black dots you see are giant flying foxes. So these are bats that are really, really, really big. It's a huge colony of them. Um, so you can see here one of these bats close up. I think they're actually really cute. This is a researcher and scientist um, actually netting the bat and he's gonna put a tracking device on the bat so that they can look at where the bat goes every night. But apart from the mammals, Mauritius is really famous for its birds and this bird in particular. So this bird is called the dodo. You may have heard of it. And the dodo is extinct. It means there are no dodos left uh, on our planet. And it was actually a bird that was driven to extinction within a hundred years of the arrival of Europeans on Mauritius. And it's a really sad story, but what came out of it is actually really positive because a few years ago, a lot of species on Mauritius, a lot of bird species were also almost about to go extinct. So this is the Mauritius kestrel. And at one point, there were only four individual Mauritius kestrels left in the entire world and one breeding pair. But because of this legacy of the dodo, Mauritians got together and they said, no, we don't want to be an island that just loses species. We don't wanna be known as an island where birds go extinct. We wanna do something about this. And what they did is they banded together with scientists from Mauritius, from international, with international scientists and together they actually brought this species back from the brink of extinction. And there were once four, and there are now over 300 Mauritius kestrels on Mauritius. So I got to document some of the work these scientists were doing. And that wasn't the only issue they were having. This is the echo parakeet. It's another bird that's only found on the island of Mauritius. There were only 10 left 
And now thanks to the same efforts, you can see these little eggs in the captive breeding program. There are over 400 echo parakeets on Mauritius. And so it's really an example of a time where people decide that they want to make a difference and they just go out and do it. And it's a lot of hard work, but they're able to save these wildlife species. Um, while I was out in Mauritius, I got to go on a really great adventure. And part of my work is not just documenting the conservation stories, but also the scientists and the people behind those conservation stories. And this is a boat trip I took out to a tiny island off the coast of Mauritius. And if you remember how small Mauritius is, this is just a little island out in the middle of the ocean off the north, north coast. And if you see the people in the background there where the circle is, we had to approach this island. There's no landing dock. And I had to jump off of the boat onto the island without falling in the ocean. And that was how we got, had to arrive there because generally no people are allowed on this island. And the reason no people are allowed on the island is because it's really a haven for wildlife. So this is called Round Island. And they only allow scientists on the island. And you can see all the scientists are carrying these barrels. That's because we had to quarantine or all of our equipment to make sure we didn't bring any seeds from foreign plants or any insects or ants or you know cockroaches onto the island. So all of our gear and clothes and food had to go in these barrels for like 72 hours ahead of time and had to be picked through. We had to open up all of our pockets, make sure we weren't bringing anything on. And because there are all these restrictions, it's just this incredible place that is full of amazing animals. So there are seabirds nesting all along the island. You can see them nesting in these little rock crevices. You have to be careful where you step. There's also reptiles that are found nowhere else in the world except on this tiny little island. So this is called the Round Island Boa. And there's beautiful day geckos. This is the Mauritius ornate day gecko, a really colorful gecko that comes out during the day instead of at night. And it's really a, a haven for some of these bigger species. So one of the incredible conservation success stories there is the story of the Aldabra giant tortoise. So this is a really, really large tortoise. Um, it's originally from the Seychelles, but it was brought to Mauritius and to Round Island to help give it another chance because there were not many Aldabra giant tortoises left. And now the island is basically kind of covered in tortoises. There are tortoises everywhere you look. They're doing really, really well. And here you can see some baby tortoises. They number all of them because the scientists are trying to keep track of them. And every year these tortoises get a checkup and it's a scientist's job to go around the island and find all of the tortoises and then actually put them on a scale and weigh them and give them a little checkup to see how they're doing in their new home. And it is a really big challenge, I can tell you, to pick up one of these big tortoises and get it up on that scale. So that was a lot of my job is to just show what people are doing to help wildlife. And as part of my work, I don't just take the photos, I also try to figure out how to show those photos to the right people, the decision makers. Um, uh, the policymakers, politicians, and people who can help. And so we put together a photo exhibit in Mauritius that has traveled around, I think, to over 30 venues in Mauritius now. It's also on another island. And we took this to schools. We put it in the U.S. Embassy in Mauritius. Uh, we also put it in museums. And it was about all of the incredible animals that Mauritius has left. So it's really focusing on those positive conservation stories and getting people excited about um, their endemic wildlife. And this was in partnership with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation and a lot of incredible scientists and local conservationists um, in Mauritius who are really doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what a conservation photographer does. Um, and I know we wanna have time for questions, but I just wanna also show you briefly um, what other types of work I think that you can do with photography, because this is also a, a month about um, women scientists. And part of what I do is photograph these conservation stories, but I also communicate about science. So a lot of times I'll work directly with scientists to tell their stories. And I think it's important because when I was younger, I didn't know that you could be involved in science in this way. 
not just as a scientist doing the research, but also as a science communicator. And so this is a project I'll just show you briefly where I went to Guatemala with this incredible female scientist, Dr. Stephanie Grokey, who is a volcanologist. And Dr. Grokey studies active volcanoes um, she's always been interested in geology and rocks, but she didn't really know she wanted to study volcanoes until she was in college. And she uses photography uh, and time-lapse photography where you take a lot of images in a row and speed them up and you can see motion um, or see movement where the eye, the eye normally couldn't see it. She uses time-lapse photography to study active volcanoes and active lava domes. So part of my job as a science communicator is to travel with scientists um, and to actually go with them to these remote locations and photograph their work so I can tell other people about it and so they can tell other people about it. And this is the volcano we were studying in uh, Guatemala. Uh, you can see the, the smoke coming out of the active lava dome and we put our camp up here on top of this big volcano so we could use those cameras that she had to actually photograph the top of that active lava dome. This is our camp at the top. So we were camping up on the top of that big mountain for a number of days um, in order to collect the data that we needed. And this is what that little lava dome looks like from, from above. And so we had our camera focused right in where that smoke is coming out. And here's the, just the very beginning of, a, of an eruption. And what we were doing is taking a photo every four to five seconds for 24 hours at a time to be able to take tons of photos and to see um, subtle changes in the surface of the lava dome that we would not be able to see with the naked eye. And you can also see what that volcano, this is that same lava dome at night. So you can see what that looks like. So part of my job is to talk with Dr. Grokey, learn about her work and her, her scientific research and try to figure out what type of images we need to be able to communicate about that. And we got to do one of these um, live events with students through National Geographic Explorer Classroom and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants from the top of that volcano, which was pretty amazing. And so we got to actually talk with classrooms like yours with that lava dome in the background. And that was one of my favorite parts of the whole expedition. And just like in Mauritius, one of the things that we did was work together also with Ross Donahue, another explorer who's a cartographer and a graphic designer to put together an exhibit in Spanish and English that is still in Guatemala uh, that really talks about the science of volcanology and the risks and benefits of living near active volcanoes. That's really what a science communicator does. And I think that's what I've got for now, um, Joe, if we wanna go to some questions. Absolutely, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, Gabby and I remember that event very fondly from the top of the volcano. It was really cool to have the three of you uh, up there as the clouds were moving over and that view down, it was pretty wild. It was, it was really fun. All right, very cool. Well, I think it's time to start meeting some of our classrooms and start stealing some questions from them. Let me just gently close the page. There we go. So let's start off. Let's go to Algonquin, Illinois. We've got some fourth graders hanging out with Mrs. Fusco. Let me get her microphone turned on. There we go. How are we doing fourth graders? All right, just before you ask your question, Gabby, do you mind uh, hitting the stop screen share at the top so we got you nice and full screen again? Absolutely, there we go. Perfect, we got gotcha. you. All right, fourth graders, we're ready for you. I have a camera at home and um, when I zoom in and trying to take um, close up pictures, it, um, it's always blurry because I can't, because like it's hard to keep still. How do you keep so still and get the unblurry photos? That is a great question. So I will tell you that sometimes when I can, I use a tripod, which uh, is a, you know, a three-legged kind of um, stand that I can put my camera on. You can also get something called a monopod, which is just one, a one-legged stand and that helps you. But if you don't have a tripod or a monopod, I think it's all about how you hold your camera. And so a lot of times I see people holding their camera out like this, far away from their body. And the thing is that your hands actually move quite a bit, okay? So that means that your, your camera is gonna be moving as well. And so what I recommend is that you hold your camera in like this with your arms braced against your, your body 
And even you can stabilize yourself against like a tree or a lamp post or a building if it's there. And that'll help you reduce the shake in your, your photos and hopefully get you some sharper photos. But great question. All right, good question to start us off. And I think I'm gonna stick in each classroom for two questions to start because we have the time today. So if there's another question in Illinois, I know I saw a couple more hands. So if there's another one, why don't you come on up? Um, what's your favorite photo that you What's your favorite thing you took in a photo of? Oh, that is a great question. And you know, I should know the answer to that because it's definitely one that I've been asked before, but I think it changes all the time because it's whatever photo I've, it's often like the last photo I've taken. So recently, I think uh, a photo that I made that I really love is, um, well, actually, it's some photos from that baby sloth moment. And it was, I really like that photo I shared with you, but I also have a photo of just the baby sloth on its own alone. And photos for me are about kind of the memory of being there. And that for me was one of the most magical wildlife moments I've had recently because the baby sloth went off on its own and I was so nervous that it was going to fall because it was so tiny and it didn't seem like the mother was paying attention, but it was fine. So the whole time I was watching it, it was going up really, really, really slowly. And then it stopped at some kind of cecropia leaves. And I watched it for over an hour kind of chewing on the cecropia leaves. And then I realized that it hadn't made any progress at all because it didn't have any teeth. So it was just gum gumming on the cecropia leaves like a baby. Um, and I love that. I love looking at that photo because it reminds me of how I felt while I was while I was photographing the baby sloth. Great question. All right. Very cool. Well, we might be able to swing back again. But before we do that, we are going to head to uh, Ontario this time. So we've got some students hanging out uh, in Guelph, Ontario. This is Ray's group. Looks like some seventh graders. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Guelph? Yeah. Good. All right. Who's got a question for Gabby? Let's steal two questions. I think I've been I've been asked to ask their questions, if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, we are currently doing our own little photography course where we are trying to capture elements of nature close up. And we are using our devices, our handheld devices, rather than cameras. And the class are um, aware of how much time uh, they are taking to look at their pictures and edit. And they were interested to know how long or if you edit and what your process is. Yeah, great question. Uh, that is definitely a very time consuming process. So I, I will say that I do not edit my photos in terms of changing elements of the photos. So I don't take things out or put things in or make significant changes to the color or you know the content of the images. I might crop a little bit um, of the photo out if I think it's a little bit better, but usually not more than 20% or so. Uh, but in terms of actually reviewing the images, that's what I think is the most time consuming process. And so, I am, um, I usually try to do it soon after I come back from a trip or else I'll have folders and folders of, of images um, that I have not had a chance to look through. And I use either on my computer, sometimes I can, I use Adobe Lightroom, but there's all kinds of free programs that you can use as well to quickly edit. And what I do is I just star the ones that I wanna go back to and I gradually narrow it down and narrow it down. And maybe I even ask for the opinion of my, my friends or my colleagues. Um, because a lot of times, like, I, like with the baby sloth photo, the photos that I like are sometimes not even the best photos that I've taken. So it's always good to get feedback from somebody else when you're editing. Good question. All right, great question. Do you have another one? Let me turn the mic on uh, just to check. Wanna ask about future conservational? Trips. Andrew, did you want to ask that one? We wanted to know, we recognize that you went to lots of places and wanted to know if you have another conservational trip planned. Yes, absolutely. So I am going to be going to um, Malawi, um, which is a country in on the continent of Africa and East Africa in May. And I'm going to be exploring some areas in Malawi, 
has a very famous lake called Lake Malawi, um, but also trying to figure out some other trips in some countries surrounding Malawi. So that's my next my next big trip. But I'm also working on some just some projects around here near nearby because now that I'm in school, it's harder for me to take off for three weeks or a month at a time. And there's plenty of conservation stories that are right here in Florida. Yeah. All right, good question. Let's see, let's go to Dallas, Texas. Grade six is hanging out with Mrs. Elliot. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing grade sixes? So good. Yeah. So a lot of grade sixes of packed in there. I read in two classes because Gabby's so good. This is kind of a follow-up question. How do you pick where you go? And if you could go anywhere next, where would you photograph? Oh, great question. Uh, I, I pick where I go because I try to pick where the story is the most interesting. So I would, sometimes I would pick a different place if I was just going to go on vacation. But when I'm working, I'm looking for um, stories that I think need to be told, right? So um, last year I spent some time, for instance, in Southeast Asia, um, which is one of my favorite regions in the world. And there we were working on some stories on um, the wildlife trade, uh, specifically where people keep songbirds. Um, like you, songbirds would be like bluebirds or blue jays or cardinals that we would see in North America. Um, they have different species there and they keep them as pets and it's having a big impact on the wild bird populations. And so that was a story that I didn't think had gotten enough coverage. And I worked with some scientists there to help tell that story. So that's how I kind of pick where to go. Um, but in terms of places I would really love to visit and photograph, I'm really keen to get to Australia, which I have not ever been to. Um, and I'm also really keen to get to Papua and Papua New Guinea um, over in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, one of those is part of Indonesia and they have incredible animals like the, the birds of paradise, but also incredible coral reefs. And now that I'm getting into underwater photography, I am eager to get in the water. <laughs> so great question. All right, I like all of those locations. They all sound great. And I especially like getting under the water. That's even better. And I spent a year living in Australia and I highly suggest that you get there as soon as you can because it's such an awesome place. Uh, okay, very cool. Let us go now back to Canada. Let's go to Brantford, uh, Ontario. Ms. Anovich has some students hanging out with her. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Brantford? Hello. <laughs> Hi. All right, who's got a question for Gabby? So you guys mentioned earlier about the pros and cons about uh, living near a volcano. Can you list five pros and cons about living near a volcano other than the obvious? Sure, okay, so I, I'll, I'll do my best to do five. Well, so one, I guess some of the pros are that um, Volcanic soils are really uh, rich, nutrient rich. And so people like to live near them because um, it's good for farming. So a lot of coffee beans um, are grown near, volcan near volcanoes. And so uh, they produce really, really nice, um, really nice crops. And so that's why people like to live near them. They also are very temperate, nice regions to live in in terms of the climate because they're mountains. So you can have a really, you know, hot climate down at the bottom of the volcano, but as you get up higher, it's just nicer place to live because it's higher elevation and altitude. They're also kind of nice places in terms of tourism. So there's a lot of tourist industries around volcanoes usually. And uh, I didn't show the photo, but around volcanoes are often hot springs. And so a lot of tourists like to go close because of the volcanic activity, you have hot water. So we got to go visit some hot springs, which was one of the fun you know, fun moments of being on that assignment um, was photographing those hot springs. Uh, but in terms of the risks, um, of course you have volcanic eruptions, the obvious, like you stated, um, but you also have um, other hazards that come out of living near volcanoes, like these giant mud flows called lahars that can kind of come down and destroy everything in their path. Um, and those can happen even when you don't have a large eruption 
um, like we're thinking about in terms of having um, a lot of a lot of damage from from lava. Um, and you can also have a lot of kind of projectiles coming out of volcanoes and um, sometimes uh, rocks as big as cars. And so those can also cause a lot of damage. So those are just some of the some of the benefits, but also some of the problems. All right. I think you did pretty good. I counted more than five. So I think good. I think you nailed it. And I was thinking of one just when you were talking about the hot springs, thinking about when I was in New Zealand for a while. Um, the geothermal, the potential for geothermal power. So that's another reason that could potentially lure people to live close uh, to those volcanoes. Very cool. Um, let's see, let's just stick with that class for one more. See if you guys have one more question or should we swing back to you a little bit later? Oh, yeah. Oh, we're here, okay. We're here, you're on. <laughs> um, our class, in this class, it's called Green Industries. We're learning about forestry and conservation. So there was a question about essentially, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but if any of the, the forests that you've taken pictures in, if there's ever forest fires, um, I guess kind of like what's the damage to the wildlife and then how long does it take to come back from it, if you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think that the way I'll answer that is that in some of the areas I've worked in, there have been forest fires. Um, but forest fires are, can be and are a naturally occurring part of a lot of systems. And the problem is that we have kind of been afraid of forest fires and for good reason, right, as people. And so we've often suppressed fires for a long time and that basically builds up the fuel load. So it makes these fires that do eventually happen way more intense because um, there's a lot more vegetation in, in the undergrowth. There's a lot more small vegetation and the fires burn hotter and longer. And so that's a really big issue. There have been areas that I have worked in. I've never actually photographed a forest fire myself, but um, like I've seen the evidence of fire in many places I've worked and you can see it on the bottom of trees where forests are managed correctly. Like in South Africa, I've seen forests, the evidence of forest fires. Um, even out in the United States, like in Sequoia um, National Park, because a lot of forests need fire to regenerate. And so fire, I think fire is a really interesting and controversial issue. And one of the things I study in my PhD is conservation marketing. So I study how we um, message, how we create advertising campaigns for conservation to get people to do things for the environment, like in a positive way. So that's what I'm really interested in. And if you're studying forest fires, you should look at the history of Smokey the Bear, which is a really interesting case study because it's been a very, very effective way to get people to be afraid of fires, but it's actually done a lot of damage as well um, because it's led to this fear of fires um, and fire suppression within the United States. Yeah. All right, I think that's an awesome question and makes me think about Australia. Obviously it's been in the news a lot lately, but you're right, we totally forget that fire is a natural part of a lot of ecosystems. And there are lots of plants and tree species in Australia that wait for fire to release their seeds because there's more space to grow, there's uh, enriched soil. So fire is actually a normal part of a lot of ecosystems, but we do cause issues with our fear of fires, that's for sure. Yep. All right, good question. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go back to Mrs. Elliott's group because I'm not sure we actually gave you two questions. So you're back on. Um, what was the first big photography trip that you went on and what lessons did you learn from it? Great question. Huh. I think, well, one of the, fr the first trip I went on that was big as a, as a kid was probably to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is in, on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina in the Southeastern United States. And it's an incredible national park with lots of diversity. And I think what I learned there was to really um, be patient. I actually have a really vivid memory from it of being out photographing a pileated woodpecker. And I was kind of walking through the forest photographing this really large woodpecker, woodpecker. And as I would get close, it would fly away from me. And I would get a little closer and it would fly away from me. And another photographer approached me and said, you know, I, I understand that you want to photograph this woodpecker, but if you notice, you're disturbing the woodpecker's behavior. 
Like it's trying to eat. And every time you get too close, it flies away. And she gave me this advice in a really, really nice way. Like she didn't reprimand me or like tell me I was being doing it wrong. She just made me aware of my influence on the animals. And that was a big lesson for me. And something that I think about a lot when I photograph wildlife is like trying not to disturb the animals or to change their behavior in any way um, that I'm just there as a passive observer. And um, that's a big lesson that I've taken away even from that. And I think I was like 12 years old at the time. Great question. All right, really good question. Uh, we'll swing back to your group because we might be able to squeeze one more in, but let's go back to uh, Guelph, Ontario, see if they have another question for us. We have a question about uh, how old you were when you went on your first conservational trip. Oh, great question. I think the first big, big project I did where I was really focused on telling conservation stories. And, and even before that, I had been taking photos of conservation issues. But the first big trip I did was to Peru. And I was, I guess I was 20, 20 years old. And uh, National Geographic, that was my first grant through the National Geographic Society. And they have these wonderful grants. At the time, they were called Young Explorers Grants. Now they're called Early Career Grants. And they helped fund me to go and spend uh, almost 10 months living in Peru and photographing the impacts of a new highway that was being built across Peru and Brazil, across the entire continent of South America, essentially. And my job was to photograph this small section of the highway that was being completed in the Andes to Amazon region. And the Amazon rainforest, this transition place um, area between the Amazon rainforest and the high Andes mountains is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And so I was photographing the road, but also photographing the incredible animals uh, that lived around this area. So that was one of my first big projects. And I did learn a lot of lessons on that because I was camping in the jungle for a big portion of that trip. <laughs> All right. Jumping back to our group in Illinois, do you guys have another question for us? We're ready for you, bud. Um, do you like how you take photographs of animals? Yeah, I mean, I love, I, yeah, I have to say, I really love my job. And I think um, it has its challenges sometimes. Sometimes I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. Sometimes, you know, I have to be away from my family a lot, which can, can make me sad. But the moments that I've been able to spend with animals in the wild, I've, absolutely worth it all. All right, I have a question that I was thinking about when you were showing your slides and we saw the manatee and the, the, the mother and the baby. And I noticed that the mother was a lot cleaner than the baby. It, the baby had a lot more algae. Is that because the baby doesn't move as much as the mother or it's not as experienced at getting it off? What do you think? It's a great question. I have been meaning to, this is just like a couple weekends ago and I've seen other babies that had less um, kind of algae and growth on them. So I'm, I'm actually not sure of the answer. I kind of hypothesized while I was out there that it might be because the baby is a lot, has a lot more wrinkles and just has, so it has a lot more like substrate for things to grow on it. Um, because it was definitely moving around a lot when I was there. Like it was just kind of floating around. It was coming up to me and being curious. Um, but I will, I will try to find that out because I was curious about that as well. All right. Just notice the mother looks so clean and the baby was just this green, I know. So I was wondering <laughs> what was going on there. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we can probably duck into one or two more classrooms before we wrap for today. So just give me a signal in your classrooms, a wave or someone come up to the camera. And it looks like we'll start in Texas. Let me get that microphone turned back on. Um, what is the strangest animal that you've seen? And have you ever been scared of any of them? Okay. okay. Strangest animal. Yeah. Great question. So I think my favorite strange animals are the leaf-tailed geckos of Madagascar. And so you'll have to look this up in your classroom after we talk because I don't have any photos immediately available. But there are these amazing lizards, well, they're geckos, that have um, tails that are shaped like leaves. 
and each of the different species is camouflaged in a different way. And one of them is called, uh, the scientific name is Europlatus fantasticus, which is, I think, an awesome scientific name. It's also called the satanic leaf-tailed gecko. It's got these bright red eyes, but it's got this amazing tail that has notches out of it so that it looks like um, a dead leaf with holes, you know, kind of chewed into it. And it hangs upside down during the day so that it looks like a hanging dead leaf. So you should look that up. Um, so that's one. And in terms of being scared of animals, uh, there, there are certainly moments where I have been a little nervous, particularly around big animals um, like elephants in Africa. Or um, I was in India last year and I even got nervous with seeing the tigers um, from, a, <laughs> from a safari jeep because they're just so big. But for the most part, uh, I think the most dangerous part of my job is being in taxis in other countries, <laughs> not really, <laughs> or even in the United States, um, being, being in taxis and being with other drivers. The animals are pretty safe, to be honest. It's mostly road traffic I get nervous about. <laughs> All right, fair enough. And I've seen my share of road traffic. I can see why you uh, could feel that way. And I think I see waving in Guelph. Let's see if we've got a question there. Right. You want to get a bit closer, Sam? Have you guys ever used drones to assist your photography experience? Yeah, great question. Absolutely. So um, I am not a, a good drone pilot myself, but a lot of my colleagues that I work with, we will use drones. And on that project in Guatemala, we had a drone with us and we used that a number of times to photograph the camp and the surrounding area. Uh, they're a great tool to be able to get a different perspective, which is what kind of photography is all about is, you know, good photographs show you things in a new and fresh way that make you um, curious and make you see things differently. And so drones are a great tool for that. And a lot of the scientists I work with use drones to collect data as well. All right. Oh, and maybe we have one more. All right, we'll squeeze one more and let's go to Mrs. Anavish's group. Your microphone is on. Okay, hello. This is kind of, I guess, a two-part question. So for some context right now in, sorry, where are you from again? Where are you coming from? North Carolina. Okay, so in Canada, and I'm sure this happens in the States too, right now we have a lot of protests happening against pipelines going through traditional indigenous land. And so we've got a question, it's kind of a two-part question one about if an oil spill were to happen from pipelines kind of your opinion or experience on the, the detriment to wildlife and then two is protests against pipelines on indigenous land something that you would consider ever taking pictures of for conservation or have you ever been or kind of what are your thoughts on that Great question. Um, so I am not an expert on oil spills, but I imagine that there would be some big um, problems for wildlife if an oil spill happened. I think a big problem for wildlife with pipelines in general is that um, they are built oftentimes in also not only on indigenous lands, but also in wildlife habitat. And it's not just the pipeline itself, it's also the, um, the roads that have to be built to get uh, you know, construction materials in to build the pipelines. So it, and that's the same thing with roads um, as well. You know, you can say, oh, we're going to put a one, one lane or a two lane road through a forest. It takes a lot more, there's a lot more destruction and of habitat involved in that process of constructing a pipeline or constructing a highway um, than just putting in that pipeline or that highway. And so that has a huge amount of detriment to wildlife because it just opens up lands for, for exploration. Uh, in terms of photographing uh, protests, it is not something I've done very often. I've photographed at some climate protests um, before in, in different areas where I've just attended the protests, but it's certainly a very big conservation issue, um, both for indigenous peoples and for um, the wildlife. And, you know, that we share, we share the earth with, with these incredible animals and we have to find room for them, but we also have to have um, room for ourselves and, and room for, um, you know, I think, I think nature is a human right. And so I, I think that that's a really important conservation issue to be documenting. And I would encourage you all, if you're interested in photography, 
get out there and photograph and, and tell these stories because we need people all over the world to be out there being witnesses to these issues and telling stories. All right, very well put, Gabby. I love it. Um, our classrooms who joined us today, thank you so much to our classrooms in Canada and the US. Really great questions, really well thought out questions today. And then Gabby, thank you so much. Thanks for taking some time from your schedule to hang out with us and share your adventures uh, and your future adventures. Absolutely. It was great to meet you all and have a, have a great rest of the week and get out and take some photos. All right. The microphones are on. And boys and girls, a big goodbye and thank you before we sign off for today. Thank you everyone for hanging out. We have lots of events coming up over the next week and a half before we wrap February. So we hope to see your classrooms again. And once again, Gabby, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. We are gonna sign off for now. <laughs>